This next point is on existentialism, which I thought was interesting. So this is on page 98 and 99. So I'll just quote some of it. So you may know Albert Camus was a Frenchman who wrote, and it seems like a lot of the, I guess these are all French existentialists, pretty much, like Sartre and Camus. And so he mentions um, The Stranger, 1942, uh, The Plague, 1948. I actually have his The Rebel, which I'm working through, but not very fast. He mentions, uh, and I've seen it in the bookstore, but I didn't buy it, and I should have now. Another book that Camus wrote is called uh, The Myth the Myth of Sisyphus. And apparently Sisyphus was some something in Hades. And this guy, this person in Hades called Sisyphus, he was condemned to roll a rock up a hill, and then when it gets to the top, it it rolls back down, and then he has to push it up again. This is the metaphor that existentialism people use to talk about life. They see life is absurd, and here's why. I'll quote some of this now. With a sharp logical scalpel, existentialism cut through the line, the lies and pretenses, the bad faith with which the great majority of people and societies hide reality, especially the meaninglessness and death from themselves. Beneath the surface, it revealed the alienation, sense of absurdity, nausea, angst, Soren Kierkegaard's fear and trembling, and sickness unto death that attend a breakthrough into unblinking awareness that the world has no human meaning, no morality, no purpose, no plot. But despair was not existentialism's end. In terms that would in time come to seem melodramatic, it argued that true existence, full consciousness and humanity, came only from accepting the radical and painful freedom that recognition of our absurd condition forces upon us. To live meaningfully in the existential scheme of things is to act with the full knowledge that to act is meaningless except as a manifestation of freedom. So what I thought was interesting here is that existentialism is saying is that much of our life, we hide things from us that concern us, but we can't do anything about it. So just think of the think of the very basic question that probably everyone is confronted, or at least heard of, maybe not answered, but they have heard of it. The whole question of why bother doing anything when we're all going to die eventually, right? The the very cynical, uh, all we can expect from life is death and taxes. Not love, not uh, money, not uh, goodness. All we can 100%, 100% expect is death and taxes. So why bother live at all? If at one point, if at some point we will cease to exist. So that's the basic existentialist question. And what the existentialists say is that while most people have heard the question before, no one really comes to, comes to terms with it. No one thinks about it. No one spends time on it. They just dismiss it as an unanswerable question and then move on and forget about it. And for the existentialists, that is what they call, and, and Nietzsche certainly uses the phrase, that is what they call, I'm trying to find it here, the bad faith, the bad faith in living is because we ignore and push away these essential questions, almost in the sense that a lot of people just want to be ignorant of these pieces. They don't want to know, just like the whole thing about like, if you actually saw the cows getting killed in the in the butcher, or not the butcher shop, the slaughterhouse, if you saw the chickens and the, and the animals getting killed and chopped up for meat that, that shows up in the grocery store, all nicely packaged in plastic. If you actually saw what happens, you would then not feel so good about eating the meat, right? In a sense, if you saw the reality of our situation, of our messy, dirty, and ultimately terminal lives, you would feel nauseated. You would feel like, what an absurdity is this existence? Existentialists want people to grip tightly the our life's circumstances. They do not think it is genuine living. They think it's bad faith for people to go through life ignorant and to go through life with whole aspects of human life being kept away or, or imprisoned out of our conscious minds. They want people to be conscious of all these things because then we are living genuinely. We are living with the full consciousness or full knowledge 
of our circumstances, that we are not just a horse with the, you know, those horses that have the blinders on when they're using them in the streets and stuff. Most of the time, they have these little blinders on the sides of the eyes of horses so they can only see it forward because they might get freaked out by the rest of the of reality around them. The same kind of thing the existentialists would say that humans live. Humans live with these blinders on their eyes, or in, in this case, on their minds. And they don't want to see the messy existence that and the terminal existence that we all live. People are, are too often living on a diet of blue pills. I think this blue pill, I can, I always mix it up, blue pill, red pill, I'm not sure. Whatever the pill was, that pill, the, the ignorance pill, everyone lives on, everyone lives too much on a diet on the blue pill or whatever pill it is. The existentialists want everyone to be hitting reality hard every day with their fist. And so then lies the question, must we live a life with that full knowledge or can we block off some parts of it in order to have a more blissful life. This is the whole, like, ignorance is bliss thing. What do you think? Where's Where are the values there? And here are some examples now he gives. This is on page 99. So he says, It also made tragedy seem the most meaningful of literary forms. We no longer hear much of tragedy, but in the 1950s, it was being discussed by everyone, and courses in various kinds of tragedy speckled the Yale curriculum. Aristotelian purging of pity and fear, as in Oedipus, Hegelian tragedy as a moment in the dialectic of the world spirit, when two goods, the old and the new, for example, family and state, in Antigone, are in direct conflict. Nietzsche's recurrent tragic destruction of man's Apollonian dreams of order by by the Dionistic frenzy that, as in the Bacchae, obliterates form and individuality. So I thought that these are ways of, of talking about this kind of existentialist life context that we're supposed to either, that we're supposed to be in full awareness of. So like the Nietzsche one, for example, the, the, uh, the Apollo is, is reason, and Dionys, Dionysus was pleasure, and he's like a the Greek god. He was drunk all the time, all the time, and and uh, bathing, and and just just he's like a party animal is the Dionysus, and everyone has that kind of part of them, the Dionysus side of them, that want to just lay around and and smoke joints and and have lots of sex and dr have lots of drink and food and just everything's just wonderful and everything's just a party every day. And then there's the Apollo side of us that wants to be more conservative and wants to be proper and wants to to um, use science and reason to uncover tr truth and to write about it and seem intellectual. And there's that side of us too, more prim and proper. And, and that's just another way of, so what are we? Are we, can we be one or the other? Um, can you really mix both of them? There's this kind of tragedy. We, maybe we would like to be one or the other, but can we be as human, as a human species? So that's it, it's one form of tragedy, right? So tragedy is a way of exploring this existential abyss we may find ourselves in. What, how we might ought to be is tragic because of how we are.